Good morning again, everybody. Um, you let me know and back if I need to address anything here, okay? All right. Hey, I'm Heather. I'm the pastor of City Church. Um, this is not our church building. Uh, a lot of you guys already know that. Uh, we meet in downtown Iowa City. But, you know, we've been virtual since COVID-19 and social distancing began. And um, when Brian passed away, we just really wanted to physically gather in person and, and come together with our city church family and some friends and colleagues from the crisis center. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Life Church for allowing us to use their auditorium this morning and the handful of volunteers from Life Church who are just helping us with greeting and some of the tech stuff. Um, we're really grateful and super thankful that we could use your building today. So thank you. And I just want to thank all of you, too, for just being mindful of the safety of others while you're here, um, being mindful of social distancing and, and wearing a mask, unless you're up here and you're talking in a microphone. Um, I think after the service, if you want to do a little more socializing without masks, the parking lot might be, uh, if you do it in a safe way, a great place to do that. I also just want to acknowledge Brian's parents and his brother, um, Gary Jungin, and his wife, Karen, and his mom, Valerie Jungin, and his brother, Luke, are here today. And we're so glad that you guys are here and can participate. Um, and those who know Brian just know what a special relationship he had with you guys. Uh, I also want to thank some colleagues from the Crisis Center. Um, that's not the right name. It's now the Community Crisis Services and Food Bank. Um, and they are here today. And we'll hear um, Cindy, one of his colleagues, share a little bit about Brian in a little bit. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Kathy and Bob. Kathy and Bob, where are you? Oh, there you are. Um, but Kathy and Bob were some of the hikers who found Brian and, and helped him in the last few moments of, of his life. And so we're just really thankful that you're here with us today, too. Um, if you're here today and I haven't mentioned you by name, it's because you're, you just know who you are to Brian, your, your city church family or your longtime friends. And I just want to acknowledge we're all just in a, in a tender place over losing Brian. Um, our grieving processes, they're, they're kind of all over the place, aren't they? Uh, and maybe for you, the dust has settled a little bit on the initial shock of learning about his passing. But most of us in the room... We are experiencing a lot of different emotions from day to day or week to week. Um, there's sorrow, there's grief, sometimes anger, loneliness, <clears throat> and mixed into all that, um, you might have some laughter and you might have some gratitude for some of the memories that you shared with Brian. Our goal today and the reason that we've come together is not to brush away sorrow and disappointment or questions about his, his life, but to seek comfort really first in celebrating the man that Brian was, the amazing friend and human being that he was to, to all of us, and secondly, to seek comfort in understanding his death in the context of Brian's faith. And I know, and if you know Brian too, you would know that he would not want this celebration of his life to go by without us talking about his faith in God and his relationship with Jesus and how that not only shaped the life that we saw him live, but also shaped his expectations of life after this life, of life after his spirit left his body. So we're going to honor Brian today. We're going to celebrate him. We're going to hear from his colleagues and his friends. Um, but first, would you guys just pray with me for a moment? God, first of all, I want to thank you for Brian's life, for the amazing gift of the life that you created, imagined, and delighted in. Thank you for all the ways that Brian has blessed and enriched all of our lives and the lives of people not even in this room this morning. Maybe they're watching over live stream. Um, Lord, I'm asking that you would just release comfort over each one of us today and over everyone watching and that your comfort and your joy would be with us and that we could even laugh together in the midst of our tears and rejoice in the gift that Brian has been to us. In your name, amen. 
We have a video to share with you this morning. It's not a video that we were able to capture all of Brian's life, but um, captures many of the last several years of, of his life. And you'll notice that midway through the video, uh, the story begins to be about how Brian began to intersect with this community we call City Church and, and his role in that. So you'll get to see and even hear from him a little bit about that.
Yeah, so one thing that was always a blessing to me was I always had a strong like uh, connection with music, and Iowa City's just like so filled with. Um, I, even before I lived out here, I found myself like driving, driving out for concerts, and just enjoying the community and the diversity around Iowa City. Um, and especially as I develop like my relationship with God through like my time out in Iowa City as well, like I came to realize like what I was always searching for was like that relationship with, with Jesus. And um, I, I don't, I'm excited to share that good news with people who are, who are searching. I think that that's what they're looking for. And um, I just look forward to seeing the joy and the peace that's gonna come through them having that relationship. Thumbs up. <laughs> Emphasis moments. I'm kidding, just... yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Okay. okay. Brian M. Junkin was born in Iowa City, Iowa on November 28, 1987, son of Gary Jungen and Valerie Ryan Jungen. He graduated from Unity Christian High School and received his BA degree in psychology from the University of Iowa. He was employed at Medarev in Coralville and worked part-time for the Community Crisis Services and Food Bank in Iowa City as part of the Mobile Crisis Unit. And if you know Brian, you know that serving on the mobile crisis unit was one of his great passions and joys. He was not a man who discriminated with kindness, um, but really sought to be a friend to everyone in his path. Um, Brian could be challenged by the behaviors of others, but you actually wouldn't know it by how patient uh, he chose to be around people, even if they weren't exhibiting their best behavior. Uh, people felt his compassion and his kindness. And over and over, the week that he passed away, I kept hearing from people just how Brian would always remember the details of their lives or send them messages asking how things were going, um, sending texts, you know, calling to check in and see how things were. And in this kind of behavior, he really created an environment around himself in which people felt like they were loved and they were cared for. Uh, some of you guys know that there was an older gentleman in Brian's neighborhood who didn't ever leave his home. And Brian met him because this older gentleman would just hang out on his front porch. And Brian just had a heart for people on the margins and uh, wanted to just bring a little extra attention, a little blessing to this gentleman. So he would routinely go and buy a sandwich from Witch Witch or Jimmy John's and deliver to this gentleman. And in the process, just struck up a friendship with him. He was the kind of person who offered dignity to people who were often in undignified circumstances. It was very common for Brian to tell me on a Sunday morning that he had stopped in the Ped Mall on his way into church to talk to someone who was homeless and invite them to church or invite them to come get coffee at a place where they would feel welcome. For all of you who know Brian, you also know he had a very dry sense of humor and a very well-developed inner and outer nerd, uh, as, as well as gamer. And uh, he enjoyed spending his time with family and friends, 
playing video games competitively, playing Magic, the card game. Uh, he'd just been involved in the first few weeks of City Church's first ever Dungeons and Dragons group and was loving that. Yep, Tony, one of our leaders, said Brian had one of the most unique and well-developed characters he had ever heard about before. And um, for those of you who do role-playing games, you'll appreciate this. Uh, Brian also just loved music, um, writing music or going to concerts with friends, listening to music, and not much mainstream stuff for Brian. I mean, he loved eclectic sounds and was so excited to share what he felt were rare musical treasures with others. He was also a contemplative. He was a reflective soul. He read books about what it meant to know God and to follow Christ. He enjoyed listening to the sounds of trains and cicadas. We also know that Brian enjoyed exploring the beauty of God's creation in a long park ramble. Linnea, who's here, reminded me that Brian posted this last August on his Facebook page. He wrote, Sometimes taking a day off to spend time with Jesus exploring a park is more refreshing than months of typical weekends off. And as we know, it was at a park on May 22nd where Brian went to, in his words to me in a text that week, spend the day with Jesus. And it was where and when Brian's life on earth came to an end. And Jesus allowed him to come home and spend eternity in his presence. I want to make some personal remarks to you all, just as Brian's pastor and as Brian's friend, before the service shifts to hearing from more of you. Uh, I met Brian six years ago, but it feels more like 10. Uh, we met at Life Church, where I was an associate pastor, and Brian signed up for a class that I was teaching. And he was so engaged in the content of the class that I asked him to help facilitate the next class. And then he and Michelle both ended up taking over the class and training other leaders and other people to facilitate. And he just so enjoyed um, supporting and helping people in that context. About four and a half years ago, uh, he made the decision to be part of the team that started City Church downtown, and that became the beginning of just a much deeper friendship with Brian. Um, he became friends with my family in a significant way for the first time. I was his pastor, I was his friend, and he and, and we and a team of several others just embarked on a journey of what it meant to start a faith community. Some of you guys have, have commented to me, actually, that Brian's outlook on life changed a lot when he joined um, City Church and became part of the team and started playing electric guitar with the worship band. He didn't have a whole lot of confidence in his skills at the beginning, but I don't think any of us did. Uh, and we, we just grew a lot together over the last four and a half years, or four years, and Brian's contribution to the music that we played became essential to the sounds of our worship on Sunday morning. Uh, his unique riffs and his additions to the song, he, he didn't just copy what he heard on a recording. He would come up with something new and something fresh, and I just know that our music on Sunday mornings, once we're able to get back together, it's not going to be the same without Brian, and I'm going to miss him rolling in with his pedal board and his electric guitar, always about 10 minutes late and always apologizing later, <laughs> even though I didn't mind. Um, Brian's involvement in the church and in my family's life was really pervasive. There just wasn't anything going on in our family or the church that he didn't know about. Um, activities and interests of, of our kids, even, he would ask uh, them about. And he served on our planning team and the launch team, as I mentioned, which meant he knew all the ins and outs of starting a church, setting up, reaching out to new people. Brian counted the offering every week and made the deposit at the bank. Uh, he served on our prayer team. He often acted like a one-man welcoming committee to anybody new who would walk in the door. And he always found ways to encourage people and connect with people in just that sweet, humble, and unassuming way that he had. Uh, he participated in our book groups. And he planned, helped plan or completely planned many of our local outreaches, such as those to the Ronald McDonald House. When COVID hit, 
Um, Brian couldn't sew, but he offered to be a courier between my house where I had mask supplies and a bunch of other sewers in our community. And so he drove up to Cedar Rapids and Hiawatha several times and back to my house and then to Iowa City to deliver uh, mask supplies as we were making masks for the police department. So he was really involved in every way that a person could have been. And often when he knew that the, the load of, of leading a church was great, he would check in and say, hey, is there anything I can do? Like anything else I can do. And then I was his pastor. And I prayed with him. I talked with him about struggles and fears and hopes and dreams as I would with anybody but Brian checked in more often than most, often via text message or Voxer message, just to let me know how his week was going. And there wasn't a week that went by, excuse me, there wasn't a week that went by when I didn't think about Brian and pray for Brian or send Brian a text message if I hadn't heard from him in a while. And I share all that because I, I know not all of you know me well or a city church family well, so I just want to give you context for the relationship that, that we had and that he had with the church family. I think everybody in the city church family would agree that in the time we've known Brian, he's really been a man on a journey to love God and to love people better and to become more like Jesus in the way that he made his way in the world. Uh, it was just the week before Brian died, the Sunday before, that he was telling me and Tony that, you know, he only had a month left in his current neighborhood before he moved, and he really just felt like he hadn't connected enough with his neighbors, and he was even thinking about, gosh, could I hand out free supplies, like essential supplies to them, or like, how can I connect with them and just show them God's love, and so... Um, in kind of a humorous experiment, he put on his mask and went for a walk Sunday after church, just kind of looking for anybody to connect with. And um, when people saw their masked neighbor coming toward them aimlessly, they went inside and closed the door. Um, but he had a really good <laughs> sense of humor <laughs> about this. And he didn't give up. You know, that was Brian. He just kept seeking to love people. The love of God that Brian encountered in the person of Jesus Christ, it changed Brian. If you know Brian's story, he was not always a follower of Jesus. He had some pretty dark ideas about God, but at some point his heart was transformed. He had an experience that Jesus called in the Gospels being born again. And that's, that's a metaphorical way of saying of having a whole heart revolution, of seeing something in a new way. And for the first time, Brian was able to see with fresh eyes the character of God, the, the kindness of a God who is love and a God who's faithful, and then surrender his life to Christ. You also know that Brian had more than his share of suffering in this world um, because of the type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that he had. It was a type that he knew there was a good possibility could end his life prematurely. Um, because of his EDS, Brian endured more suffering in his body than I think most of us will ever experience in a lifetime. Some of you have known him long enough to, to have known him through health crises where he came close to the point of death, and even um, in the time I knew him, there was a, a period of time where I didn't know if Brian was going to come through a, a current health crisis. But it's actually understanding the suffering that he experienced that puts me more in awe of the faith that Brian had, especially now that he's gone and we have a chance to reflect and I think see some things more clearly. Uh, I think it's easy for, for us, if we've if we're people who've lived a privileged life without much pain or without much suffering, to, to one, you know, either never think about God and matters of ultimate importance, or to two, maybe just mentally assent to the belief that, yeah, God's out there, Jesus is a good guy, but not maybe ever take the time to engage with or seek out the creator of the universe, um, to maybe not ever find out what it means in the words of Jesus to lose your life so you can find it in Christ. And I really believe Brian's suffering and experiences of suffering made it impossible for him to just set aside 
ultimate matters and matters of eternal significance because he was a man regularly confronted with his mortality. I believe that his suffering and then the, the simultaneous experience he had of being born again and experiencing God's presence and his spirit and his peace and his joy in the midst of suffering set Brian on a journey to truly follow Christ, to find his life in Christ, to try to walk lockstep with Jesus and how he lived and in how he loved others and how he used his resources and his time to serve God and others. And, you know, someone who doesn't know his whole story uh, might think, what a great guy. We're really going to miss him. They don't make, that, <laughs> they don't make him like, like they do uh, any, like him anymore. Um, but I think if you understand his story and you understand the cert- uncertainties that he lived with every day and the, the suffering that he encountered from time to time and the fact that in spite of that, he did what all of us do And he got up every morning, and not only that, but he got up courageously, and he lived life as fully as he could, as faithfully as he could, with as much joy as he could, as much as as he could be like Jesus, loving others as he himself was experiencing God's love. And, you know, that makes him, in my book, not just a really great guy that we're going to miss a lot but I think it makes him somewhat a hero to all of us who are also trying to faithfully follow Jesus, Uh, an example of the kind of suffering love that Jesus himself exhibited on the cross. One of Brian's friends back in Clinton called me the week after he died, and uh, he said, you know, I stopped being a part of a church a long time ago, but Brian was the closest thing to Jesus I ever saw in this life. And I think some of you sitting in this room would say the same thing, that uh, you experience the love of God through Brian in a way that you haven't anywhere else. Now, the good news for us is that the love of God doesn't end with death. It doesn't end with our own death. It doesn't end with the death of, of someone we love like Brian I think we can be comforted by the words of the Apostle Paul who said in his letter to the Roman Christians, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The love of God that Brian found through Christ, it actually gave him an eternal hope that no matter how hard life got on this earth, there was a Savior who not only forgave his shortcomings and his sins, but would ultimately make all things new. A Savior who would ultimately bring an end to suffering and to death and to pain and to disease on this earth. And so he had a longing to fully realize that eternal hope someday. And I think the longing that Brian had for that, uh, is, it's a longing that I think all of us have at our core. And, and bear with me if you're like, what are you talking about, Heather? But I think we all at our core have a longing for eternity, a longing for a profound and unsevered connection to the source of all life and truth and beauty. Whether you know the source as Jesus Christ, as Brian did or not, I think part of the human experience is to long for this kind of transcendence because our experiences in this world are broken. The last four months will tell us this. With disease with racism, with, with uh, broken relationships, violence, war. I believe that at our core, we all really long to taste and experience life that's greater than the life that we live now. And I know a lot of us younger people, like maybe my age and younger, if I can still be lumped in with that group, um, if we don't have particular health problems or haven't experienced a lot of suffering in our lives, I think we tend to feel somewhat invincible. Am I right? 
Like, we're not going to get COVID. Like, you know, we're going to be fine. We can take those risks. But Brian was very aware of his earthly body's limitations. He knew that it wasn't reliable and that it would betray him sometimes. And I think it was for that reason that he talked more than any other person his age that I've ever met more about the joys of being in God's presence someday without pain and without suffering in heaven. He had a longing for that. And it's not that Brian wanted to die and leave us all behind right now, but that he was looking forward to the experience of the fullness of that life with God, maybe more than most people I know. The Apostle Paul, who was persecuted and endangered because of his mission to share the good news about Jesus, he also talked about what it was like to live with this longing for heaven in the midst of suffering. And he said, while we're in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. I think many of us, if we're honest, have an ache for our life to be swallowed up with life, with greater life, with greater peace, with greater joy. And while we can taste that on this earth, and I know Brian did through God's spirit, and the fullness of that experience is what Brian is having right now. Because of his faith, we can be assured all is well with Brian's soul. All is well with him. He is not suffering. And I think his experience, even if we workshopped lots of ideas, is uh, the experience he's having right now in heaven with Jesus is probably better than any of us could imagine. And yet, on the other hand, we're left with our sorrow, aren't we? And we're left with our um, grief and our missing his company and his jokes and spending time with him. And we're left to walk through grief as we feel that separation. Uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know, the separation's only temporary. That's what, what our faith teaches us. But it's just awful, just the same. There is a reason that the Bible refers to death as our enemy. Because death sucks. It just does. But I want to encourage you all that, that we're not alone in grief. Uh, and that even though Jesus raised all kinds of people from the dead, he still stood outside the tomb of his friend Lazarus before he raised Lazarus from the dead. And he wept. And he mourned. Because the sting of the, and pain of separation sometimes just feels unbearable, doesn't it? And yet, because Jesus was a man who knew many sorrows, there's this special place in Jesus' heart for those who have sorrow. There's a special place in God's heart for you as you're grieving the loss of a friend. And a special blessing that Jesus wants to bestow on you. Um, in fact, in Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So if you're mourning in this room today, God's blessing to you is his comfort. Today, tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now, as you look back at this time and you think about Brian and you feel how much you miss him, God's promise to us is his presence and his sustaining comfort. And, you know, I don't just want you to know that, but I want you to also think about Brian cheering you on on your journeys. In the, in the book of Hebrews, the writer is writing to a bunch of Christians in the first century, and these Christians have experienced a lot of persecution because of their faith. They've been suffering a lot because people didn't like Christians back then very much, and sometimes they don't now, but that's a different story. Um, they were persecuted for their faith, and they had sorrow upon sorrow, but he reminds them, the writer reminds them of all the heroes of the faith who are watching them 
from heaven and cheering them on. And he calls them this great cloud of witnesses. And he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I want to submit to you that Brian is in your great cloud of witnesses. He's in the great cloud of witnesses to, to our lives, to our journeys, in the crowd of people who are rooting for you to faithfully put your hope in Jesus, no matter what the trial, no matter what the struggle, no matter what the obstacles, and to just run after him with all your heart. Some of you are sitting here and you know exactly what Brian would say to you about the struggles you're facing because you had that kind of relationship. You know exactly how he'd encourage you and what he would say and how he would nudge you to seek God with your whole heart. And for some of you, um, Brian's way of doing that was to shamelessly invite you over and over and over to church. And he didn't mind. And he knew you didn't either. But but two thoughts I want to leave with you today. God's comfort is always available to us. And Brian is cheering you on. He's cheering on mom and dad, Luke, Karen. He's cheering on his friends who have just been so close to him for many, many, many years. He's cheering you on, city church community. He's cheering us all on. So I am going to conclude my comments with um, inviting my daughter, Evie, to come up to the stage. Evie uh, wrote a song for Brian the week after he passed away, and we just thought it would be appropriate to share with all of you this morning, and I'm sure Brian doesn't mind hearing it again.
Thank you so much, Evie. We really appreciate it. Okay. So we want to take some time this morning uh, to hear from more of you who are here. And we're going to have a bit of an open mic in a few minutes. But first, I, I'm just going to adjust a little bit. First, I want to invite Cindy Hewitt from the Community Crisis Services and Food Bank to, to come. And I've asked Cindy if she could just say a little bit more about Brian's involvement and his contribution on the mobile crisis unit. So Cindy, will you come? Thanks. Thank you, good morning. So um, obviously, my name is Cindy and uh, I had the honor of working with Brian in the mobile crisis um, outreach um, counseling unit at a Community Crisis Services and Food Bank. Um, that's in Iowa City. Um, the program is a program where counselors work alongside clients of all ages, races, ethnicities, cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds during some of the most difficult times in their lives some experiencing suicidality, others homelessness, others addiction, others mental health crises, along with all the many physical, emotional, and mental struggles that accompany those circumstances. Brian was an exceptional crisis counselor. I asked my colleagues to share with me a few thoughts about Brian when I was gonna come up and speak today. And um, there were three words that were used consistently to describe him, some of which we've already heard this morning several times. Kind, that was always the first word out of their mouths. Compassionate and non-judgmental. Through his work with community, Brian shared with us the ability to sit with people in some of their most vulnerable moments. He was able to affirm people's worth and dignity when they couldn't see that in themselves. And he gave comfort to people trying to make sense of the pain and loss they feel. Even when the stories others shared seemed too painful or were full of so much loss it felt unbearable, Brian stayed. And in staying with those people, Brian was able to give them the gift of feeling human again, being worth something and finding a new path to healing. Brian was a gentle presence in the spaces he inhabited. He was kind and welcoming and genuinely curious about the lives of those around him. There was no pretense when talking with Brian. A colleague of mine, uh, of Brian's, excuse me, um, shared a specific memory with me he remembers he and Brian sitting with a younger couple in their living room, holding space for them to process a difficult history with depression and the state of their relationship falling apart. Brian navigated that space with such care and gentleness, finding ways to validate the pain both people had felt, encouraging plans for addressing the history of depression, and never once displaying an ounce of judgment as they honestly and earnestly talked through the history and future of their lives together. Brian held that space as two people's lives were seemingly crumbling around them and managed to provide the time and expertise to navigate tough conversations about suicide, mental health, and the meaning of their lives together. Brian and I worked a lot together, mostly overnight shifts. So we would get together sometimes at two in the morning, three in the morning, and we'd go out on a call. I'm kind of a spaz, what I would call a spaz. Brian was so chill, so we really kind of evened each other out on these calls, right? So one night, I'll make this very brief, but we went to a call. Um, it was two, three in the morning, and um, we got there, and there was a huge fight going on between two large groups of people at this apartment complex and it made us a little nervous. Okay, nonetheless, we needed to find our client's apartment. We had to call the ambulance for our client, which they were supposed to be on their way. And in searching throughout this vast apartment complex, 
um, we could see down the long breezeway, the fight going on at the other end. And somewhere in the distance, I saw a man who I thought was a paramedic. And I thought, oh, there they are. Let's go. <laughs> so I just took off and just like I always do, went straight for the direction of the fight <laughs> to get to the paramedic who I thought that was. Um, and, you know, I, Brian was somewhere behind me and I was on my mission. And it turned out to be an armed security guard, was not the paramedic. So um, after the fact, I, I had to stop and think to myself, oh, that probably wasn't the most brilliant thing for me to do. And I had to apologize to Brian for putting him in that situation. And he said, oh, Cindy. <laughs> it's, he kind of laughed, you know. He said, you know, after you went down there and just started down there, and I thought to myself, well, I guess I have to go now, too. <laughs> if you were going, I have to go. So, but he said, you know, Cindy, all that tells me uh, is that you have an undying faith in people. And I said, you know, I do. And so, sorry, instead of being angry with me for doing that, he turned it into a positive. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I was doing so well. Um, Anyhow, and that's what he had the greatest ability to do, was turn anything into a positive with, again, no judgment, no ill will, no hard feelings. Um, <sighs> Brian was really passionate about his work with mobile crisis, and I think he made a world of difference in a lot of people's lives, including mine and my colleague Stephanie, who's here today also. He was passionate about, about authenticity with the people around him. We'll all miss him really dearly. Um, and on behalf of Community Crisis Services and Food Bank and all of us in Mobile Crisis, thank you for allowing us to participate in your celebration of Brian. He was an extraordinary human. Thank you. Sure. We have the microphone share in a safe way. So, um, Sandy, thank you so much. Um, uh, Brian's family just so graciously um, requested that memorial funds for Brian be given to City Church. Uh, and, you know, as our planning team was talking, gosh, what do we do with these funds that have come in? We want to do something to honor Brian and to honor his memory. And one of the things that Brian just so wanted was for our church to be able to be a blessing to the community. So we are passing on those funds to, to crisis services. Oh, and um, we just want to say thank you. Thank you. And thanks for honoring Brian today. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay. All right. We're going to have an opportunity now for, um, for an open mic time. If you'd like to come up and you'd like to share a story about Brian or talk about um, who Brian was in your life. Um, we want to just provide this time. And I want you to keep in mind, I know sometimes it's a little intimidating to walk up steps onto a stage, but um, times like these can be just particularly comforting and healing, especially to family members and close friends as they, they hear about a loved one being talked about and they hear stories. So um, if you're on the fence about sharing, don't feel shy. Um, you're in good company here. So um, I want to invite whoever would like to come first. Actually, Dad, you volunteered. Do you want to come? Okay. Morning, everyone. When I was waking up one morning the day after Brian passed away, I had some thoughts come to me that I was able to write down, and I'd like to share those with you this morning. Hello, Brian. I'm troubled about you dying, because I haven't returned your call yet, the one that you said, how you doing? Is there anything for you I can get? So you went to the park to spend time with God, maybe to tell him some things that you thought he should know, but I'll bet you were surprised when he said, you're coming with me, bro. You're a beautiful person, a beautiful spirit. Our lives have been blessed by having you in it. Some tears may fall, some have fallen. 
And as I remember you, I'm already bawling. We love you, our prayers from us all. Until we meet again, I will return your call. For those of the, I'm not used to a mic. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Valerie Jungan. I was Brian's mother. I should say I am Brian's mother. And everybody here has been touched by Brian. Um, Heather did a wonderful job of describing, and Cindy also, some of the more current years of Brian's life. And I just wanted to maybe share um, some things from his younger days, like birth. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Um, I was eight weeks early when Brian decided he, his mission was to get out and start doing good works. And so they sent me out here to Iowa City in the ambulance. And he was born um, after four days of labor because they were trying to suppress the labor so that I wouldn't um, uh, have him as early as he was wanting to come. Well, after four days, I told my family, if I don't have this baby pretty soon, I'm going to be too weak to push him out. So God must have heard that comment, and um, he was born. Uh, Gary, was it Thanksgiving Day or the day before Thanksgiving? It was Thanksgiving Day, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, well, I really gave thanks that little baby was finally out in the world. And um, I used to call him the little, uh, my little glow worm because remember when the glow worms were popular and they had the big dark eyes and the little hat and oh, he was so adorable. But then I was a little biased. Um, so, uh, he was in the neonatal intensive care unit in Iowa City. I think that's where birthed his love of Iowa City. And um, God just laid this on my heart on the way out, on the drive out here today. So excuse me if I have to pause sometimes to kind of gather my thoughts. I'm not prepared. God's just using me as a vessel right now to share this story. Um, so after Brian was born, there was a very serious virus going through the nursery. A lot of babies had it. And Brian caught it also. He was very, very ill. And one morning when I was still staying in the mother's uh, unit, a, a nurse came down and she said to me, I'm sorry, but your son is not doing well. You might want to come down and um, see him and spend some time with him. And I got up quickly and went with her. And uh, when I got there, he was uh, blue. And my, I had called my father and my sister to come out. Well, they, I believe they were already on their way out. Anyway, uh, they got there and the nurses said, uh, Brian's not eating. He, w he won't take a bottle. His blood gases are way off. 
Um, we're doing everything we can, but he's very, very ill. And um, I could see that he was. He wasn't moving at all. So um, after my dad and sister got there, I was rather a mess, and um, they said, Val, I have low blood sugar, so they said, let's go down and get you something to eat. Um, and then I didn't want to leave. And they said, no, let's go down for a little break, and then you can come back up. So I finally agreed, crying as I left. Um, I, we got downstairs to where the big compass, if you're familiar with the hospital, there's a big compass in the floor. And just past that compass um, is what was the chapel at that time. They now call it the meditation room. Um, I still call it the chapel. Anyway, I asked my dad and sister to go ahead and that I would catch up with them. I wanted to spend some time in the chapel. And um, I went in. I was the only one there. I closed the door and I sat down in the front bench. And that chapel is a beautiful mural of light. And this bright circle of yellow in the middle, and then blues and whites, kind of like the sky and clouds on either side. Um, I just sat there and I just gazed at that mural, and it, it was made of light. There was light shining from it. And I was crying, and I, I prayed. I prayed so hard. And I said, God, if you will let my son live, I promise, I promise you, I will raise him to be the best Christian that I can for as long as I can. And then when you need him back, I'll let him go back to you, but please, please let him live for now. Excuse me. Thanks, honey. And um, as I opened my eyes after I had prayed, the the light, the glowing yellow light that was in the middle, that was like a sun, but didn't hurt your eyes. It was just a warm, glowing light. I looked at it, and I could see a face. And um, it wasn't Brian's face. I knew whose face it was. It was, it was God's face. So I laughed. Went down to the cafeteria and ate two bites and convinced my dad and sister to go back upstairs. And we got up to the nursery and the two nurses came running up to us and they said, "I we don't know, we don't know what happened, but while you were gone, Brian started waking up and moving around." His blood gases straighten out. Um, he's eating, and it's like a miracle. We don't know what happened. I know what happened, and I know who let him live. And I did what I promised, and Gary and I saw Brian through so many struggles, medical struggles, right from the beginning. He did suffer. He, the least little bump in his skin would just split right open and we'd be in the doctor's office again or we'd be in the ER again. There were at least, at least three, maybe four times when he almost died. But God had a mission for Brian. 
because when his colon ruptured spontaneously when he was 19 and he had to have emergency surgery and the head gastroenterologist that did the surgery at the hospital said, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to save him because his tissue was so thin, it was like wet tissue paper. He said, I couldn't get the stitches to hold. He said, but finally, I was able to get some staples to hold and some stitches. I said, thank you for everything you've done. That's when he was 19. God let his dad and I and his stepmom have that many more years. Brian would have been 33 this year. And as coincidence, Jesus was 33 when he died. So I truly believe that Jesus is watching over Brian. And God and Jesus have been for many years. And I was so blessed to let God have me be his mother on this earth during this life here. I can't wait to see him again. I'm just going to end with a little psalm. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So that's what I will cling to. And I know that God will get me through this as painful as it is. Brian would want us all to go on and have happy, healthy lives. And he also may be knocking on your window some night saying, you sure you don't want to go to church tomorrow? <laughs> I love you all. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Who else would like to come next? I'm Joel Kettleson, good friend of Brian's. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to say. I didn't even know if I wanted to say anything before on the way here, but just like sitting here, had a couple thoughts come to mind, and so I put them in a text quick. Um, the last, I I kind of I met Brian here at Life Church, um, and uh, we became friends quickly. And he's quickly became one of my um, closest friends. And over the last few years, I've kind of like gone through a deconstruction and reconstruction of my faith. And um, Brian was one of the few people who walked through that with me and just was always there for me. He always asked how I was doing, asked how he could be praying for me, um, what he could be doing for me. Um, you didn't judge me, like many of you said. Um, he wasn't one to judge you. Um, in my cynicism or anger um, with people or God or whoever. Um, he was always just so loving and kind. Um, he showed me what a true follower of Christ should look like. And um, I just think 
it's my now responsibility and each of ours to live as Brian would live not judging others um, loving each other and uh, just showing kindness and um, yeah my wife and our boys will miss him a lot he was he was a good guy. He was he was the best. So, thanks. Hi, um, I'm Kristen. Um, sorry. I've known Brian for probably 11 years now. Um, <laughs> first time I met him, actually, it's very interesting. Um, I started dating Trent, and uh, we went to go see Brian when he was in the hospital. And I'm like, you know, it's a little probably inappropriate. <laughs> it's my first time meeting him. You think he wants me in the hospital? But Brian being Brian, he was very loving, very kind. And our relationship just blossomed from there and on. And I'll never forget how I first met him. <sighs> um, a bunch of us, Brian's close friends, um, went to his spot where he passed, and uh, I wanted to say this speech, but I was a little too nervous and everything, but I played Brian's song he wrote for Val, um, and we all just sat in silence um, while I played that, but this is what I was gonna say before I played his song. As the days are hectic and long, I overlook a lot of things, whether it be people's accomplishments, they post online, or talk in person, ranging anywhere from getting a new job, having a baby, being sober for X amount of time, and so on. Something I have fought with myself as of late is that I have immense guilt for not paying attention and admiring more of my friends' accomplishments, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this. Crying over the recent years found a burning purpose and passion in his faith. Given his physical ailments, I admire Brian for having such a strong devotion rather than blaming his God for those ailments. I noticed, as Brian's other friends have noticed, a change in his overall demeanor when he joined City Church. It seemed as though the new light was beaming from him. He smiled more, he choked around more, more so than he already did with his very dry sense of humor, which we all know. He was overall happier. I did notice that change in him. What I wish I would have done was tell him how much I admired that about him, tell him how happy I was for him. <sighs> gave him that attention to detail that he gave practically everyone he encountered. I knew Brian played guitar for his church and would sometimes write songs at home. This is again where I failed to admire his accomplishments and his beautiful writing. I wish I would have told him more how amazing he was doing and just keep it up. I could feel the influence of bands like Explosions in the Sky in his writing. I wish Trent and I would have came with Brian to see them last October. We all have things we wish we could have done or said with Brian. We all fill ourselves with guilt and how much we think we missed out with him. But as I've come to tell myself recently and my friends, don't dwell on those missed opportunities. Treasure your time with Brian. We are all lucky to have befriended him. An amazing kind of person he is. Just take comfort in knowing that he all knew we loved him and he loved every single one of us. And we're all gonna miss him. So thank you.
Hi, I'm uh, Brian's dad, and I'm, uh, I really don't like to get up in front and talk in front of everybody, but I, I have to do this. Um, I want to do this. I just want to tell everybody how proud I am of Brian. He was just a wonderful person, and uh, he cared about people so much. He had a compassion for people. He, uh, he really did, and, and uh, this, this is hard. I'm going to miss him, but he was a, just a good, good Christian person. And, uh, and I love him. That's all I can say right now. I love him. I'm going to see him again. Hello everyone, I am a member of City Church and I had the opportunity to serve with Brian on the planning team and got to spend time with him. I've been on the regular service time. Uh, permit me to read a couple of scriptures that speak to my memories of Brian and what it meant to be in that community with him. I'm reading from Romans 12, verse 4, it says 4. For as in one physical body, we have many parts, and all of these parts do not have the same function or use. So we, numerous as we are, are one body in Christ, and individually we are parts, one of another, mutually dependent on one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. He was gift, his prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. He was gift his practical service. Let him give himself to serving. He will teach his to his teaching. He will exhort, encourage his to his exhortation. He will contribute. Let him do this with simplicity and liberality. He will give aid and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind. It would do acts of mercy with genuine cheerfulness and joyful eagerness. I chose to read the scriptures because they speak so well of the brand I, I knew, and they speak so well of the memories I have of him. Uh, being on the planning team, much of what we did was to plan outreaches to communities outside of ours, to reach out to people who were outside of the church community. And now uh, we always remember the cheerfulness of Brian and his eagerness to reach out to others. He always took the lead. If there was an opportunity to serve others, Brian was there. And I will always remember his consistency. If Brian skipped the church, it wasn't in town. And some of the lessons I took away from Brian was his humility. Uh, no matter how young you are or how bad it you seem to be, Brown would come over to you and show you love and kindness. Uh, we had several moments uh, checking the offerings together, and Brown turned those moments to opportunities to check up on me, know where I was in life, what was going on with me. When I told him about my decision to volunteer at IC Compassion, it really encouraged me and told me I wasn't on the right track, it encouraged me to do that and do so much more in serving others. At the last time I saw Brian, he came to give me this mask. About the greatest gift, gift I think Brian gave to me is a resolve to live a life of service, to love others and be a bridge in reaching others. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Tony, and I um, serve also on the planning team and with leadership with um, with Heather here at City Church. And uh, probably, uh, I feel like I'm one of the people who didn't know him as long as everybody else, but um, he lived like three blocks away from where I lived, and my family were just beginning to like like build relationships. We were like before COVID, we had plans for like, you know, food nights and game nights and stuff. And it was, uh, it was Brian where we were, I was talking to him initially, myself, Brian and, um, and Mark about like a gaming, online gaming night. Like, and um, I just, the, the thing I want to share about him is the character that he created for it. Cause it was crazy. <laughs> The name of the character was Solzar Yar, which I think, I think uh, like the Solzar meant something. I think it was like Yar Har Har, eventually like the dry humor, right? So like, so he uh, wanted to play a wizard, but a wizard that was mute, that can only talk by passing you notes. <laughs> I got to tell you, he had the most backstory of backstories. <laughs> His family were a bunch of gypsies that, were, I'm, this is true, he literally, we talked, he talked with me through his whole story. I, his family were a group of gypsies who would scam people out of their gold by, this is, again, everything I'm telling you is literally what he told me. <laughs> they would scam people out of their gold by uh, burying fake treasure, creating false treasure maps, and then taking people on treasure hunts to find a fake treasure that they would pay. So the reason why the character was mute was because they tried to do this to some enchantress type of person. They found out, and so the enchantress cursed Sozar but in cursing him, he got magical powers. <laughs> so he has a tendency to want to like rob and stuff. He has this kind of like grifting kind of personality. He's always looking for an angle. Now, all that being said, he had a secret too. He couldn't control his powers. <laughs> so when he would try to use magic, it can sometimes backfire and hit his own friends. He wanted me to like play this into the story somehow. Um, and um, I think the night that we found out he passed, um, our, our community were like, hey, do you know if Brian's gonna come? And I texted him and you know, like I didn't hear back from him. So I was like, oh, I guess he's not going to be here tonight. And the crazy thing about it was that we are in this kind of forested area, kind of like a hiking area, where we're fighting off these wolves and stuff. And so, so for us to deal with that, we thought Brian's character would just lay prone on the ground. But it would confuse the wolves because they're like, what just happened to you? <laughs> And it's just weird because knowing how he was found and where he was at um, and the light that he brought, even in the midst of like this extremely complex character that created very unique situations of like, all right, he needs to text me his thought. And if he texted it to the whole group, then it's like he's talking out loud. So he has to kind of private message his thoughts to people if he wants to communicate, you know. He just was that type of guy who he wanted to bring a next level of joy, creativity, and life to people around him. And he didn't have a problem like, like enjoying life with like a sense of infirmity, right? Like he always maximized the life he had in the midst of like even in a game with a character like that, right? That's just like. It's going to be difficult for you to engage in a game, but for some reason he had the wherewithal to create life out of such a, a challenging 
thing. So I just wanted to uh, share that with you all. Uh, so I don't really have a beginning, middle, or end, or story. There's too many. Uh, <laughs> I suppose I just kind of feel obligated, especially to both of you guys. Uh, I feel a bit like you, you've become part of my extended family through Brian after knowing him for so long. And uh, there's probably some stories I shouldn't tell you. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's too much to, to say in one day, but I will say that recently I, uh, I get to spend a lot of time alone, a lot of time in cars driving, and gives me an opportunity to really think, and not, not that I'm old, but as I turned 30 and uh, started to kind of really just reflect on my life and some of those nights, I... Uh, thought about the fact that one day I'm going to be 50 and I'm already 30. I still don't talk to some people I knew when I was 20. And it's not that I don't like those people anymore. It's not that anything happened other than we just were friends. We don't really talk anymore. And I started thinking about, well, when I'm 50, who am I still going to call even if we don't live together? Like if we don't live four or five miles apart. And that list was pretty short, um, but it, right at the top was, was Brian. So I think it's safe to say that uh, of, all, of all the friends I have, and it's, it's easy to meet somebody and call them a friend, but he, was, he made it a point that there, he, he would always be one. So if there's any, any joy to find in it at this moment, it's just that he spent his time making sure that we knew that. I love him. I miss him. But I love you guys, and I'm... I'm sorry. I just love you guys. There's no one else who's doing a mad dash to get up here. Um, I'm going to close us. I just want to thank all of you for being here today, for celebrating Brian's life together. I know that we're going to keep on celebrating Brian's life. And I am just encourage you to, to visit, um, talk to the family if you can afterward. And again, you can probably do a little safer chatting in the parking lot if you want to take your mask off. But will you just pray with me for a moment? Um, Father, I just thank you for this group of people who are here today, um, who've just come together because we love Brian. We just are, are so thankful for the gift that he's been to all of us. And um, I ask, Lord, for your just continued comfort, your continued peace over his family and for those who are closest to him. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that his life would just have ripple effects in our lives that uh, as we go forward, um, whether it's in our church community or um, it's just in our personal lives, Lord, that um, what he imparted to us, Lord, would stick with us and that it would continue to impact us uh, over time and over the years. And um, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much.